Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been your own worst enemy? I'm going to make it easy on you, and I'm going to answer the question. The answer is yes. Yes, you have been your own worst enemy. I have been my own worst enemy. It's not just you that's been that way, right? Every single person in this room has been our own worst enemy. If you're joining us online, you've been your own worst enemy. We've got all got parts of our story that we wish we could change or edit, things I wish I could do over, right? Parts I wish I could select and delete and forget they ever happened. And every last one of them are parts of our times when I was being my own worst enemy. I let my feelings control my actions, right? I let my desire for something control my actions. I let, I let something take the wheel right? And it wasn't Jesus to be the, the least, right? I'm my own worst enemy a lot of times. Sometimes I convince myself that I can do something and get away with it. And being my own worst enemy, I believe myself. Sometimes I convince myself or I allow my, my, my insecurities to speak so loud and they keep me from being able to do something, being my own worst enemy. Sometimes I let my sin nature jump up and say, this is what is true about you. Or sin nature say, this is what you should do right? I'm my own worst enemy. And it's true of all of us, right? We are all our own worst enemy. And we can try and shift the blame off. Well, it was so-and-so's fault. The reason I did that or the reason I got involved in that was their fault or I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and with the wrong people. And the, but the truth of it is, can I just lay it on the table for us? The truth of it is, you have participated in 100% of your bad decisions. You and I, we are responsible for 100% of our bad decisions. I was trying to think of a, like an example that I could use in my own life where I could say, hey, this is where, you know, a time in my life where I could be honest with you and transparent with you about my own bad decisions, my own poor choices, my own times when I'm my own worst enemy. But can I be honest with you? The, some of those examples are way embarrassing to me. They're, they're really true of me. Like, I've let my insecurities speak louder than, than my confidence in who God says I am. And it's caused me to say things or do things that I wouldn't have normally done. I've let my, my confidence or my ego speak louder than the humility that I know should be in my heart. And it's caused me to say things to people that are mean and cutting. Right? Can I be really honest with you? I don't want to share those stories with you because they are very embarrassing to me. I'm not proud of them, but I have participated in 100% of my bad decisions. And can I tell you something else I learned about my bad decisions? Is that bad direction is always preceded by one bad decision. Anytime I've gotten anywhere I didn't like in life, I didn't get there all at once. It's always been preceded by one bad decision. And guess what? Another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. We've been doing this series we've called The Greatest Summer Ever because we're talking about some of the things that Jesus says are the greatest, right? Times where he said this is the greatest commandment, like Chris said last week, or this is the greatest disciple, all those kinds of things are the greatest. And here's, we called it The Greatest Summer Ever because it's summer right now here in West Tennessee. And we're talking about all the greatest that he did. And we're really good at, at titling stuff. We're very creative people. So we put them together and called it The Greatest Summer Ever. That's what we're talking about. Today, I want to introduce you to one more greatest that he says, but he doesn't really say it as the greatest. We have to read between the lines to see this one. And it's probably somewhat famous. You probably will recognize it. It's in Matthew. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. It's the greatest builder, isn't it? Look at the worst builder. But everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. It's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, the pretty simple equation is listen and do equals wise, listen and ignore equals fool. 
He who builds, who hears my words and then does them, smart, right? He who hears my words and doesn't do them, dumb. Now let me just ask this question. We've all been our own worst enemy in the past. Can I ask you this question? If you now, if you can hear the words of Jesus and know what is right, and then choose to not do them, aren't you choosing to be your own worst enemy? You know the truth. Let me just choose to like lay this out for us. What if we were the kinds of people who not only heard, but did? What if we were the kinds of people who built our house on something far more substantial than sand? Let's be the kinds of people who choose to do what is right. Now, here's the problem. It's a really simple process. It's a really simple concept. Listen and do equals wise. Listen and ignore equals fool. I don't know about you, but if I were to choose one of these two, I want to be the wise one. But you know what? Knowing what to do and doing what is right is two totally different things. Isn't it much more difficult than this? It's a really simple concept, but it's really hard to put into practice. And it's not just hard for you, right? Sometimes I have a tendency to think, well, this is just difficult for me because maybe I have this issue in my life, or maybe I have this predisposition. I, I get angry with my kids because I I just have trouble. I was the way I was raised, and so I'm predisposed to doing that. Or maybe you struggle with lust, or you're, you're, you're addicted to something, and you're like, oh, it's the addiction. It's the thing. The truth is that everyone struggles. Everyone. It's not just you and me. It's, been, it's timeless. The Apostle Paul, okay, who's a big deal when you read Scripture. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. He never saw Jesus face to face, but he came face to face with Jesus after his resurrection. And Saul, who is his old name, became Paul. And Paul gives his whole life to furthering the gospel of Jesus, which is a big, big deal. But can I introduce you to Paul's struggle? It's in Romans chapter 7, and I want you to notice something. This is long, but it's going to stick with you for a second. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. You see the tension already there. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Does this sound familiar? If I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. It, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin who living in me. For I know that good itself, that, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I have the will to do what is good. I just can't get it done, right? For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. That's what I keep doing. The law of sin at work within me. Look at what the next few verses, the next few verses say. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that is living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in within me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. That's Paul. Changed from Saul to Paul, life of going places, church planter, going face to face with people, telling them about Jesus, creating disciples, leading people with his life. And he's saying that I have the will to do what is good. I want it so badly. But truth is, there's this tension, isn't there? And I, I'm sure you noticed that every one of these particular words throughout both of those slides were highlighted. Did you notice that? 21 times in just six or seven verses, Paul uses one very, very common word, I. You know what is the problem with our will? I am in the middle of my will, right? I am in the very center of my own will. I want to do it. I want to do this. I want to do this. And what Paul gets to at the very end of this passage is he realizes at the end of that verse, that, that at the end of verse 23, he realizes that the letter I isn't good by itself. The letter I is only good to begin to spell the word insufficient because he says this in the next verse, what a wretched man I am. 
Who will rescue me? I need something from outside. I can't, I can't do this. Something outside of me has to do this inside of me. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. I, in the center of my will, is useless. It's only useful to spell the word insufficient. I don't have what it takes to overcome sin on my own. I don't have what it takes to overcome all those things. I don't have what it takes to hear the words that Jesus says and do them and be the man who puts, who builds my house on something solid. I don't have that within me. I have to have something outside of me change something inside of me. It's the transformation of my life that gives my will an application. My Will is not the question. We all have a will. The question is, how have we applied our will? So I was thinking, man, what is it that we need to do to be transformed? How is it that I can approach day-to-day -day decisions? Stuff that happens on Tuesday afternoons and, and Friday mornings, right? How is it that I can deal with my kids? How can I make choices with other people? How can I choose my words in a way that says, I want to be the kind of person who hears the truth and then does it. How can I be the person who builds my life on something far more substantial than just simply my feelings and my current will power, right? Well, the first thing I have to do is I have to start with a true desire to do what is right. A true desire to do what is right. You know, most of the time I'll say, yeah, I want to do what's right. Sure, right? But to be honest, if, if I'm really honest, when faced with a choice, I want to do what is best, what I feel like is best. And if I'm really going to start with a true desire, it can't just be my want, right? I can't say, I really want to stop speeding, unless I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to choose to stop speeding. I have to start with a true desire to do what is right. And I have to choose to say that the other option is wrong. I have to choose to say that is not the right thing. This is the right thing. And I have a true desire to do what is right. That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? Because we all want to do what's right. But what happens? We need something inside of us to change. Galatians says it this way. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Here's a big list for you. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, awkward, and the like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see what's going on? Is that we all have a will. But the, those who belong to Jesus, our faith, not, not isn't just something of our belief, it's our active faith, is our active faith crucifies our flesh with its passions and desires. It applies our will, not to the things that are, that are what God says not to do. It applies our, our will toward the things that, it, that bring about love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Do you see what's going on? We have to choose where I put my will. And I, by myself, in the middle of my own will, only lends in, to insufficiency. We have to be the kinds of people who choose to say, I want to start with a true desire to do what's right. The only way that true desire happens isn't a real want. It's crucifying our flesh with its passions and desires. It's saying what I feel is not as important as what I think, is what I know. You can't change your thoughts by changing your feelings, but you can change your feelings by changing your thoughts. Let me say that again. You can't change your feeling, thoughts by changing your feelings, but you can change your feelings by changing your thoughts. What you think determines how you feel and the way we think. It's why Scripture makes such a big deal about dwelling on the Word of the Lord or using God's Word as a light for our path, right? As a light for my feet, because when we change how we 
think, it changes how we feel, and how we feel often dictates what we do, isn't it? We make decisions based out of our feelings. But if we can choose to say, I have a true desire crucified in Christ to, to do the right thing, then we start off an entirely different trajectory. So if you want to be a person who builds their house on the, on, the, on the rock, you want to be a person who not only hears the words of Jesus, but does them, puts them in. If you want to be the wise builder, the greatest builder, then start with a true desire, a crucified flesh, a true desire to do the right thing. And then we have to do the next thing. We have to pay attention to the tension. We start off with a true desire to do what is right. This desire that's being crucified inside of me saying, I'm going to put to death the old me and I'm going to choose to pay attention to the tension. When I'm faced with a choice, there's a tension that sometimes has to be, it has to, it has to get my attention, doesn't it? When I feel this like, hey man, I feel like my wants are pulling one way and I know that there's something inside of my stomach that says, no, that's not the way it should go. Not the way you should behave. Not the way you should act, right? Like, that's not something you're going to be proud of. Paying attention to the tension is, the, is a critical piece in us submitting our will and applying our will to the right things in our life. Paying attention to the tension. It's easy to ignore the tension, isn't it? It's easy to go, well, I don't know, it'll go away in a minute, right? I'm just hanging out with these people. It's no big deal. Like, it's, it's easy to say, oh, that's just... You know, that's just the voice of my mom talking, or that's just that prudish person over there. But there's a tension that exists in there. And we all feel it, right? We all sometimes will choose to ignore it. Might be hanging out with some people, and they're starting to do some things we're not real proud of, and we're like, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. And there's a part of me that goes, oh, maybe you should bail on this. But then there's a part of me goes, nah, don't worry about it. When, whenever we feel that tension arise in us, if we want to be the kinds of people who build our house on something strong, if you want to be the kinds of pe people who hear the words of Jesus and then do them, the wise person, if we want to be that person, we have to learn to pay attention to the tension. It's attention that's needed for the tension. Because it rises up in every one of us, and if you don't learn, and it is a skill, to pay attention to the tension, you'll always be the person who knows the right thing to do, but just doesn't do them. You'll always be the person who ignores them and walks away. Start with a true desire to apply our will to the, to the crucifying work of Jesus in us, and then choose to be the person who learns the skill of paying attention to the tension in our lives. There's one more thing. Not only do we need to, to start with a true desire to do the right thing and pay attention to the tension, you need to listen to the narrative that you're creating. Let me just illustrate this. What happens in us all the time is we all create the justifying narrative. Well, you know, I wouldn't normally buy this, but then, but you know what? I mean, the one I have already that does exactly the same things, this one's got, does all the exact same things, but this one's newer, Right? Now listen, if you heard that, like that same idea, let's just use it for a phone, right? If you heard a salesman, if you went into Best Buy or you went into the cell phone store and, and you said, well, what does the new one do? It, well, it does this. It takes pictures. Oh, well, mine takes pictures. Well, it has this kind of screen. Well, it has that kind of screen. I like mine has that already, right? If you heard the salesman say to you that the only real thing that this one does that yours doesn't do is this one's new and yours isn't new, you would go, well, that's not worth it, right? But why is it we would never believe it from somebody speaking to us, but we'll believe it inside of our head all the time? Why is it that if a salesman said to you, listen, I know that you're, you're going to wreck your marriage, you're going to do all that stuff, but she's really pretty. Well, you would go, no, why? that's a terrible sales pitch, but we'll believe it in our heads, right? Well, then but why is it that we'll go, listen, you know what you could do? You can probably drive home just fine, right? Why is it that, that we would never let somebody else talk somebody into that, but we'll let ourselves talk ourselves into it because we aren't listening to the narratives that we're creating in our own mind. Let me just challenge you that if you want to be the kind of person who knows the right thing to do and then does it, it's not just a matter of your sheer willpower because your willpower, like Paul said, is completely insufficient. Life is a constant battle of I want to do the right thing, I just don't. 
There's this other law at work in me that has to be killed. It has to be drug away, kicking and screaming, and it doesn't go easily into the night. Your will, your, your, your natural, your sin desire isn't going to go, isn't going to go quietly into the evening. It is going to be drug kicking and screaming out of our lives because our misapplied willpower is something that has to be crucified within us. Starts with a true Jesus born desire to do what's right. And then to pay attention to the tension. That's conviction of God's Holy Spirit in our life. And then choosing to listen to the narrative that's playing out in our mind. Let me just challenge you this. Jesus says that the greatest people, right? The greatest builder of lives. The the wise man who builds his house on the rock is the person who hears the words of Jesus and just does them. It's not about you having the willpower to do it. It's not about you choosing to do so. It's about you choosing to walk with Jesus And allow him to transform you from the inside out. You see what happens most of us, to most of the time, to most of us, is that we choose to be informed about what to do, right? We choose to know the right things, rally up the right information, read the right books, get the right ABCs down, you know all the right stuff. But information about what to do isn't really the trick. That's the knowing. He says, you hear those things, right? But the wise person doesn't just inform. The wise person is transformed and chooses to do what he's heard. So let me just challenge you with this. Do you want to be the wise builder, person who knows what to do and does it? Or do you want to be the foolish person? The foolish person who who builds his house on sand. And when the waves come and the rain comes down and the waves crash into it and break it down, it falls with a great crash. That's your life, a great crash. I don't know about you, but I want to be the wise builder. So I'm going to choose a strong and true desire, crucified in Christ to do the right thing. I'm going to choose to listen to the narratives in my head and pay attention to the tension. Then. Maybe it can be a wise builder. 